So I will indeed just offer you a, a small case study, um, uh, and uh, my at the center of my attention will be a Jubal manuscript currently at the at Harvard University, and it is a case study that makes me feel a bit nostalgic because actually I'm going back to a term paper that I wrote in a for a class that I took with James Han with James Hankins. Uh, now, 34 years ago, during my first uh, term of graduate work at Harvard in 1987, when I still had a lot more hair than now. Uh, so, uh, manuscript Latin 40 um, of the Houghton Library uh, at uh, Harvard has uh, never been used, but is, has, um, contains all 16 satires of Juvenal and once also held Persis satires. The manuscript never has been used by editors of juvenile satires and remains today largely unnoticed among the several hundreds of codices recentiores of juvenile. Let me first give you some material details about the manuscript. The colophon, which you see here, uh, informs us that the scribe, who unfortunately remains unnamed, finished his text on the 23rd of July, 1462, in Bologna. And I'm assuming now that uh, this colophon was not simply copied uh, from, uh, along with the text uh, from, from the model, no, which sometimes happens, of course. It is not a deluxe uh, codex, but it's still executed with some care. The text is written by one hand in a humanistic minuscule with some cursive traits. It is a parchment codex, not a paper codex, so we can assume that someone with sufficient financial means was behind the production of this manuscript. And that person also found it worthwhile to pay an illuminator for the embellishment of the front folio, because the text, as you see here, opens with a four-line gilt initial entwined in a white vine scroll on a multicolored background, which extends into a border that runs over 14 lines of text and into the upper margin. Now, whereas this type of decoration became extremely popular in 15th century humanistic manuscripts, the further initials in the course of the uh, manuscript are undecorated and only two lines high. So they reflect a uh, practice rather from the Gothic era in that they are alternately copied in red and blue ink and are mainly designed to mark the beginning of each satire, thus structuring the text in the manuscript. The text uh, is written in long lines. So there's one column, not two, with generous margins and above, not below, top line. And all this is in imitation of early medieval rather than late medieval manuscripts. The ruling is in ink and not in dry point. And I have another page where this ruling is perhaps a little more uh, visible. Uh, in 15th century humanistic manuscripts, ruling was often done in dry point because this was a common practice in Carolingian manuscripts on which humanists like to, like to model their codices. But in this case, uh, for this type of, uh, uh, for this pattern of ruling, dry point was not an option since the ruling pattern is asymmetrical. You see a double uh, vertical uh, line on the left and a single one on the right. So this would give the opposite pattern on the verso side. And Alder Deroli, in his uh, classification of uh, rulings in humanist manuscripts, uh, notes that this uh, um, uh, type of ruling, this pattern of ruling, is rather rarely employed for humanistic manuscripts. So it is a bit special in, in our context. So can the extensive annotations on which I'd like to focus help us to clarify in further detail the Sitz im Leben of this manuscript? And this is in fact a methodological, methodological question uh, that we're asked to put forward. Uh, my question would be, to what extent is it possible to determine whether or not we are dealing with student notes here if there are no explicit indications in the manuscript? What might be signs of or criteria for student notes in such uh, cases? And let us start again from some material characteristics. And that would be actually one of my methodological points to look at the material evidence first. First of all, the notes are most probably written by the same scribe I would uh, uh, submit who also copied the text. I have a close up here of one particular uh, piece. Uh, it looks, uh, the, script, the script looks the same as that of the text only in a smaller and a slightly more cursive version. One of the, one of the letters that convinced me actually is for instance the R, uh, which, uh, which uh, you see is uh, very, very similar. Uh, there are some other uh, letters that are uh, very similar actually. Uh, so I would say that is the really definitely the same, the same hand as out of the text. Now is that, if that assumption is correct, it follows that the scribe did not need someone else's help 
for the few sprinklings of Greek that we find in Juvenal's text. For the scribe's ability to write Greek is also documented in a marginal comment, uh, obviously copied uh, in one process along with the Latin text around it. Uh, see, rinokeros is the Greek word. Uh, uh, I have to say the spelling is, of course, wrong. And also the etymology proposed here, uni, or the Latin correspondence, rather, uni cornus is wrong, is wrong also, but I'll let that pass. <laughs> In the text itself, the Greek portions are in red ink, which means that the scribe worked with two pens and probably left, first left the necessary space while copying the Latin text and filled in the Greek in a second phase. And in one instance, you can see Zoe Kai Psyche, we are in Sapphire 6, uh, line 195 here, he left uh, too, much, too much space. In addition, there's no evidence of correction or revision. And the only exception are two separate lines from Juvenal uh, that the scribe forgot uh, in the first instance and added uh, in the margin uh, later. The notes themselves are a homogeneous set copied with great regularity throughout the manuscript, even though as often happens, uh, they become less numerous in later satires from satire 10 uh, onwards. There is only one uh, um, uh, note that really stands out as, as uh, out of the ordinary, and that is a uh, reference, which you see here, to a uh, testimony from another classical author, in this case, Valerius uh, Maximus, uh, at the satire 6 uh, 292 on moral decline through uh, peace. So this is exceptional because Actually, the, uh, uh, in the notes, you find very, ra very rarely uh, references to, to parallel passages uh, from, from ancient literature. They are never in a separate note like, uh, like here, and uh, they uh, appear never with a signe de renvoi, which you see, which you notice uh, here, actually. That is very, very exceptional. So I'm assuming that uh, this note was added at some later stage, but I would submit still by the same person, I would imagine, but with a different pen, because the, the script is slightly more angular, but I think it is still, it is still the same hand, it's simply at a later stage with a different writing instrument. So. Now, the presumably identical hand responsible for text and notes and the very orderly layout and neat writing of text and notes make me think that the whole annotation was part of the production process of this manuscript and not merely evidence of its use. Uh, this assumption presupposes then one or more exemplars with the same notes. But annotated manuscripts of Juvenal are not rare even now and were surely not difficult to obtain in the 15th century, especially in a university town like Bologna. The scribe could, of course, have added material of his own and or left out some of the notes from his model or models. The key factor of the abundant textual tradition of Juvenal in the Renaissance is, of course, his popularity as a school author which increased already during the later Middle Ages and continued unabated throughout the early modern age and even beyond. It seems natural, therefore, to place a glossed manuscript of Juvenal in a school context. The other possible setting would be the private study of a scholar annotating his personal copy. Uh, neither alternative needs, of course, necessarily to be imagined in Bologna, even though the text and most likely also the notes were copied there. Because the first known owner of the manuscript is uh, Jean Bondieu of Salins in uh, Franche-Comté in the 17th century, uh, but we do not know actually when this manuscript left Bologna or indeed Italy. So even a foreign commissioner from the start is, is uh, theoretically uh, possible. Let us now take a closer look at the notes themselves. Hardly any of the notes have a distinct personal flavor, I have to uh, uh, admit. On the whole, the glosses and comments incorporate a great deal of the traditional commentary material that had accrued over the centuries. They do not consistently reflect, though, any single of the sets of glosses and scolia that developed from late antiquity onwards, from the scolia Vetus Tiora to the scolia Recentiora of the Carolingian age, which in turn became the basis for later medieval commentaries. And in particular, the notes do not show any trace of the humanistic commentary tradition, which was admittedly only just starting in the 1460s. For instance, the diverse arguments of juvenile satires that were coined by Guarino da Verona, whose uh, juvenile commentary is tentatively dated to 1449 and transmitted in several uh, manuscripts and printed editions of juvenile, remain absent here. 
And I found actually no connections with the few humanistic commentaries that could have been available to our scribe in 1462. One case is perhaps, is perhaps worthy of mention, but still inconclusive. The last uh, marginal uh, note in this manuscript uh, at uh, satire 1642, this is almost uh, the last uh, folio of the codex, is devoted to the tradition of the Jubilee, the Annus uh, Jubileus uh, and its ancient roots. And this note uh, resembles uh, what Gaspare Veronese, along with Guarino, among the first humanists who composed the commentary on Juvenal, explained at satire 624. So in a different, uh, in a, a two, uh, it's connected with a different, uh, with a different uh, verse uh, in the juvenile uh, corpus and Gasper's comment in addition is much longer than the anonymous note here in our codex. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't insist on that, on that similarity uh, and, uh, and deduce any, any, any real connection from it. No. The large majority of the notes essentially aims at elucidating the literal sense of the poems and is consistently focused on individual words and concepts, very much along the lines of the scolia recentiora, which uh, constitute the nucleus uh, of what became a kind of vulgate uh, commentary on juvenile uh, in the Middle Ages, uh, a vulgate commentary is eventually associated with the name Cornutus. And these, uh, the, the, this, this commentary still follows actually the style of the Inaratio Poetarum that was part of the ancient uh, grammar curriculum. There are no paraphrases, summaries or interpretations of an entire satire at all. It is very particularistic uh, aimed at individual words or groups of words. Four main types, I think, can be uh, distinguished. Um, I renounce uh, to give examples because that would take up uh, too much uh, time. I'll just give you sort of the taxonomy that I was able to deduce from the notes uh, in this uh, manuscript. First of all, and that's the most important category, there are definitions and explanations of individual words. Uh, and this category, as you see, comprises uh, different varieties. Uh, sometimes we have simply a synonym. Uh, to a word of the text um, uh, uh, for a word that is either difficult in itself or in the context. Um, and uh, some of uh, the, the uh, intention of some of these uh, notes are clearly, is clearly to, to sort of build up vocabulary rather than to explain the term in the text, I would imagine. At times, a word is clarified by two uh, terms, two clarifying words, and that is a technique that we know from ancient and medieval translation technique, where you often have that same uh, that same principle of the double the double translation of one of one term in Greek. Then mostly, so often we have a paraphrase or so slightly more more developed uh, explanation. Greek words are uh, uh, repeatedly uh, uh, explained more extensively, uh, with uh, attention uh, paid also to their uh, etymology. Uh, and then uh, there's quite a number of notes that elucidate a poetic uh, usage of a word adopted by Juvenal. Um, and most of uh, these um, examples concern metonymical usage of uh, uh, a term in uh, the poems of Juvenal. A second category is grammatic, grammatical explanations, and mostly they uh, deal with um, uh, particular cases. Like for instance, if you have magno, and uh, that would be an ablative of value, you find often then uh, in the margin or uh, above the word pretio to indicate uh, you know, what type of, of ablative uh, we're dealing with. Uh, thirdly, the meaning of a sentence can be clarified by means of a paraphrase, then um, uh, no, in that case, actually, uh, the, the, the meaning of the sentence is just put in a different uh, way, formulated in a different way. You can have additional explanatory text to make the, uh, the meaning of the sentence uh, more uh, clear. And you have also some parallel passages from ancient Roman authors. I had already an example in one of the previous uh, slides. But as I said, uh, these cases are very rare, actually. Uh, the paraphrases uh, in this category are often introduced by the formula quasi dicat, as if he would say, and I'll return to that uh, in, a, in, a, in a moment. The fourth and final category concerns explanations of historical, mythological, or antiquarian uh, details, and there actually the length of these notes can vary considerably. It can be limited to one uh, term, one word. Um, in the sense of a gloss, but sometimes we have uh, a whole story, you know, from Roman history or from ancient mythology, briefly uh, briefly narrated in the in the margin. 
those are my four uh, my four types of uh, notes that I found. And along these, uh, alongside these notes, the text is provided throughout with variant readings uh, drawn from one or more other textual witnesses. In most cases, one word is offered as a varia lectio for another word, but in a few cases, we have even two uh, variants. Uh, like, for instance, in this uh, spot, this is again satire six. Uh, we're now in verse 302. We see meda in the text um, and in the margin alias mordet, alias sorbet. Uh, so here he actually had at least uh, two, two manuscripts uh, to compare um, uh, the readings uh, with, with, with his own, with his own uh, text. Now, interestingly, the textual variants almost always provide a better reading than the one in the text and are often confirmed in modern editions. I mean, in this case, for instance, the, uh, the reading accepted in modern critical editions is mordet. Um, um, so uh, it is one of the variant readings uh, here. But again, because of the extent of contamination in juvenile manuscripts, it is not possible to locate the variants in any particular line of uh, the transmission of the satires. So what can we conclude on the basis of this evidence? Because of the uh, impersonal character of the notes, we are unable to associate them with any particular um, uh, contemporary scholar. Hardly any note stands out as particularly original, and there are no references to specific commentators, uh, no debate on any controversial point, let alone comments phrased in the first person. On the other hand, there is a consistent pattern in the elucidation of the text. The clearly recognizable focus and structure of the annotations suggest to me that the notes reflect formalized teaching rather than private uh, study. They do not convey individual responses to specific textual problems, but rather seem to uh, serve a systematic explication of the text. Is it then legitimate to call these notes uh, student notes? Well, I think the answer depends, um, at least in part, on the question how strictly or how broadly that notion is defined. And that question of definition is also relevant for the related term school book or class book, where the crucial point is whether to limit that expression to books actually used in the classroom or not. All too often, these distinctions are not spelled out in modern studies, so that it is not always clear on what basis annotated manuscripts come to be identified as school books or class books. Now, in this case, in my opinion, we can exclude on material grounds the idea that the notes in the Houghton Juvenal were actually taken in class while, it, while the teacher was explaining the text of Juvenal. As mentioned earlier, the text and the notes seem to be copied by the same hand, presumably in one copying process with a carefully planned layout. So if they or the model from which they were copied do reflect actual teaching, they must be a fair copy uh, of what was noted down at some point during a class. Is there now a more a specific way to decide whether these notes are associated with teaching? And to ponder that question, I propose to uh, uh, call to mind a debate between the medieval Latinists, Michael Lapage and Gernot Wieland uh, in the 1980s on what constitutes a class book as opposed to a library book. Uh, after Lapage, Michael Lapage underlined in reaction to a uh, study of uh, Wieland and Rigg that the mere presence of glosses in a manuscript does not automatically allow its characterization as a class book, Wieland attempted to define uh, specific criteria to distinguish a class book from a library book. Um, so the three points where the manuscript must be consistently glossed, and the glosses are usually based on a commentary and similar to glosses in other manuscripts. Second point, they must cover the five areas which a teacher was likely to comment on, prosody, lexicon, grammar and syntax and content. And third point, the manuscript must contain accentual marks, construe marks, that is syntactical glosses, uh, explaining the order of the words, and quare hoc glosses, glosses uh, uh, phrased as a, as a question to be put to a student. Now, Wieland's uh, criteria continue to be debated, uh, and he himself conceded in a later essay that ultimate proof on the real purpose of annotations in classical manuscripts is nearly impossible to obtain when explicit indications are lacking. Uh, looking at the notes in the Houghton Juvenal, I see no conclusive evidence of a real interaction between a teacher and a student. Because on the one hand, uh, Wieland's uh, third group of glosses is entirely missing. On the other hand, uh, that will be a positive element. Four of the five areas he stipulated cover the scope of its explanatory material. 
only prosody receives no attention in the glosses. But then yet again, there are notes that to my mind make sense only in a teaching uh, context. And one entire category of glosses for which a teaching context can be most convincingly claimed seem to me the paraphrases introduced by quasi Dicat, as if he would say. This uh, to me uh, uh, you know, makes only sense actually if you want to instruct someone else rather than, rather than yourself. Whether a student wrote these notes along with the text is a moot question. Students were known to work as scribes in 15th century Italy, but this manuscript does not yield any evidence on that point. The label student notes though might still fit if we accept it in the sense of notes written for students rather than notes written by a student. So this manuscript, I surmise, might be a copy produced for or produced by a teacher and designed to support his teaching in the classroom. And some of the notes actually make me think in that direction. And uh, this is my last example um, and the last slide also. And I'm looking at the word pegma here um, uh, in, um, uh, on this slide. Pegma is glossed with ludos. Now, uh, pegma is in fact uh, a uh, structure, uh, normally actually a wooden structure uh, that was built uh, on the uh, uh, stage in ancient uh, theaters uh, for specific stage effects. And actually uh, the, the Scolia Ricentiora uh, indicate more or less um, uh, correctly uh, what is meant, pegma vocatur massa ferri for skyniki ludun. So it means not iron, it's probably uh, uh, rather in wood, but still it is essentially uh, correct. And you see if the, the gloss is certainly derived from the Scolia Ricentiora, but it is limited to this one word ludos. So to my mind, this is actually uh, not the note of a student um, uh, because uh, you know, that simple term would not, would not, be, uh, would not suffice uh, to, to, explain, to explain the Greek term. In my opinion, it's the note of a, of a, of a professor uh, or of a teacher that uh, um, uh, should remind him actually of what he should explain in addition um, uh, um, in the classroom during an actual uh, class. Now, the, te the teaching I uh, am postulating here uh, did not need to take place necessarily in Bologna, as I uh, said. Jovenel was among the classical authors regularly read at University of Bologna ever since grammatical and rhetorical studies began to flourish there in the second half of the 14th uh, century. But given the rather basic uh, nature of the notes, the codex might rather be associated with grammar school instruction or private teaching rather than university training. And in any case, we need to locate the teaching behind the Houghton Juvenile rather at the lower end of the curriculum. And one final thought, what is perhaps most striking in these notes is their thoroughly traditional nature. The notes evince a lectura juvenalis entirely in a medieval vein as documented from the Scolia Recentiora onwards. At best, only the most uh, crass misunderstandings that sometimes appear in the medieval glosses are not repeated in the annotations of the Houghton uh, Juvenal, but very often notoriously difficult passages from Juvenal, and there are quite a few of those, are left uncommented. And in any case, there is no mark whatsoever of the new criticism humanists had been propagating for more than half a century. So that observation leads then actually to two further fundamental questions, uh, which then should be dealt with in a different paper. And they're related with each other. So it's on the one hand, the question of the innovative nature of the pedagogical principles and didactic practice of Renaissance humanism, notably challenged by Anthony Grafton and Elisa Jardine in their book From Humanism to the Humanities from 1986, and the related question of the distinctive features, if any, of a Renaissance as opposed to a medieval commentary discussed, for instance, in the proceedings on uh, Renaissance commentaries edited by Mariana Pade in 2005 and to which also my uh, uh, the distinguished person who will speak after me uh, contributed. But as I said, that is food for another paper. Thank you very much for your patience and I'm looking forward to the discussion. <laughs> Yes, uh, thank you, Mark, for your very meticulous uh, analysis of uh, this uh, manuscript. Uh, very, very interesting. Uh, and I suppose there are uh, some questions. So, yeah, I see uh, Avi Kallenbach and then afterwards Andy Petermans. And yeah. I was just clapping. But <laughs> ah, okay, yeah. Uh, Andy? Me, me too, in 
Right? Okay, but it's, it's a very uh, hard symbol to see. Yeah, Ray. Um, thank you so much. This was really terrific. Um, I just have one, maybe very small observation that might support your interpretation of regarding this as a teacher's uh, book, and that is um, the, the use of, of parchment of, of vellum like as the supporting material. I think also Paul Needham made an argument about the use of uh, parchment for school books in the Incunabula age. So, so much of the early Donatuses are printed on parchment. And his arg argument is that it would be, um, they would print this on parchment because you wanted a textbook that f the teachers use again and again, year after year to be uh, uh, something more, more substantial. And this is maybe just another footnote if you are planning to make this as an argument. Yeah, so. yeah. Well, actually, I think, uh, I think you're right. Uh, so I have been uh, thinking also about uh, the question, why is this a paper manuscript and not the, well, uh, a parchment manuscript and not a paper manuscript? You know, if I think of back of my own uh, student days, I probably could have afforded only a paper copy and without decoration. You know? So uh, I think uh, this is at least a somewhat with, with some money uh, behind it. And uh, it would make more sense to me, uh, you know, if this was a teacher's uh, copy rather than a student uh, copy, even though probably in the 15th century, many, if not most of the students uh, came from uh, affluent families and, and could perhaps afford uh, you know, also a parchment codex. <laughs> Uh, all over. Thank yeah. you so much. My question would also refer um, to the point whether it belonged to a student or to a teacher. And you were drawing our attention to the word ludos as being a gloss particularly related to a teacher or suggesting a teacher. And I was now thinking, given that it's uh, written on parchment and that you had this very lavish initial also, wouldn't that suggest that it might have been a noble student borrowing the copy from his teacher, which still contained the notes, you know, geared towards the, the needs of a teacher? Because I'm thinking of a very, very parallel case of the 16th century where a noble Venetian student was borrowing from Carlos Segonio's copies. And it was quite evident in the notes that the student couldn't really deal with these notes, but that they were taken by his teacher. And yeah. Yes, I, I think that is a perfectly uh, possible uh, scenario uh, or uh, contextualization. Yes, yeah. In the end, of course, it's very difficult to really prove these things. You know, so uh, you can sort of uh, weigh the importance of, of specific elements, uh, you know, material and uh, and in uh, terms of content. But uh, yes, that is also, of course, a scenario that yet you can imagine. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Okay, uh, we're running out of time. So two short questions. First, Martin, and then. Uh, uh, Asaf. Uh, yes, a no, very, very short one. Are notes with variant readings uh, usual uh, for a teacher or for a student? Um, um, you, you have, you have a note with uh, uh, variant readings um, and uh, variant of text, um, philological notes. Uh, uh, are they usual for students or more for a, a teacher? Well, probably more for a, a teacher. They could, of course, have been taken together. And also, uh, yes, uh, of course. <laughs> and, uh, and a student. I mean, there, of course, there's always a lot of speculation that goes on. But I would uh, insist on the uh, uh, observation that it is not necessarily a mark of interest in, in, uh, in textual criticism. You know uh, uh, that this is not uh, necessarily to be interpreted as a, as an as an uh, the influence of of, uh, of of the new criticism of Renaissance humanism because you find these collations also medieval uh, manuscripts of classical authors, uh, so that is in 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 in, a, in that's nothing new actually. Uh, so uh, yeah, Thank but you. Uh, yeah, thanks. Okay, uh, final question. Uh, thank you very much. A very uh, a brief comparative uh, general question, but very, very brief. Uh, if I understood correctly, you mentioned that there's no, there are no notes on prosody. Uh, could it be perhaps that this, uh, that it's because juvenile is in hexameter, which is relatively kind of user friendly meter. Are there, in the, in the 14th, 16th and 70s, would we find in, 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 in a text with, with student or, stu or, or, or classroom related notes, uh, perhaps uh, notes if it was on Seneca or Horace's uh, Odes, 
we would then find more pedagogical notes on on meter on the meter definitely definitely yeah. yes yeah i think that is a, that's a good point uh, you know mm. the hexameter was of course familiar uh, you know more than any other of, of the meters uh, you know and uh, with horace uh, in his odes you're exactly at the opposite end you know it's very complicated and there mm. you need some explanation actually yes that is true so it might have been that uh, the case that uh, actually prosodical notes were generally not necessary you know because the students uh, for whom this uh, this um, uh, uh, teaching was meant had already uh, familiarized themselves with the hexameter. Yeah, that's uh, that's perfectly possible. Okay, uh, thank you again, Mark, uh, for the great paper, and thank you for uh, the many questions. But 